Hi, I'm Cheryl. I'm Dan and welcome to our podcast. Where we're talking to real people about real problems in real situations. So grab a cuppa while we talk founder life. Um, today we've got James Wilkinson joining us from Woodfine Solicitors. Um, thank you for joining us. Right, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Um, I'm a dad. I've got two children. Um, I'm actually one of my children just started secondary school, and it's amazing. I've suddenly shifted from skipping rep races and space hopper races at sports day to big kids who are faster than me and just generally more impressive than me competing at a high level. Um, but no, that's probably the most important thing about me. Um, I've got two children. Um, and as an aside, I'm also a, a corporate lawyer from time to time. <laughs> You say you say from time to time. What makes you say that? <laughs> I have to do a lot of my work when everyone else is asleep. Okay. So to get away with the slightly ropey hours at times. Um, is that because of your client base who you work with? Yeah, I, it's just the nature of the job, I think, that we end up doing peculiar hours because things are done on a, on a tight time frame. Um, mm. But I, I think it's really important that my identity, number one, is I'm just... A parent yeah I love that yeah, and, and works uh, both have got to fit around each other you can't just say works or fit around the kids but I mean they they can't their kids and families can't always take a second fiddle no, no I to- totally agree with that I totally um can relate to that you say about sports day then what 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 kind of events were going on um well it, we've upgraded from space hoppers to 1500 meters okay. um which is um it was really, really good, actually. Thoroughly exciting, um, and um, and, I, and I'm glad as a school where they they compete as well. I think there's a bit of a push sometimes for for the kids just to you know get a pat on the back for for trying out, which is great. I mean, encourage everyone to try out, but yeah. I, I think you've 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 got to have winners and you've got to have the kids striving to to, to try and be up there. Um, yeah. I, was, I was very I was very proud, Dad. Oh, yeah, oh my- I agree. My husband's very competitive. <laughs> and um, yeah, thankfully, the littlest won his first race this year. <laughs> so, um, oh, yes, yeah, so, big belly. But no, we're not allowed to go. Ours have just gone into year seven at seniors as well, uh, the middle two, and we're not allowed to go and watch this year. Oh, no, that's sad. My, my son did look slightly alarmed when I sort of sent him off in the morning, nine or six later, telling him. Don't worry, I still love you as long as you, if you even if you come second. Um. <laughs> yeah, Jake, my James husband, my husband James, he'd give a similar sort of pep talk as well. Is that you kind of suggesting that if it's anything below second, then <laughs> love starts to come into question, or is it? <laughs> it's straight in the chokey. It's the cupboard under the stairs, Dan. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> and my, I'm, I'm always judged and sold off, but I've never ever let my children beat me at anything. Um, and, and but the problem is they are now actually beating me. And I, I had, I had a night the other day where my son first of all thrashed me at pool, which was pretty devastating. And then we went upstairs, and then he did exactly the same in chess. And I remember my wife just looking at me going, one of you's doing this and one of you's doing that. <laughs> yeah, we're sort of crossing over at the moment. He's becoming a much more impressive human being than his father. And also he can go for a run and go for a run the next day without having to go, oh, my knees. Oh, it's a little bit sore and a bit achy. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm thoroughly jealous that he's, he's still got a body that works properly. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. It sounds, sounds like... Comp- competition and uh, almost trying to do your best at things uh, is quite important to you what why is that it's satisfaction isn't it I mean we've only got sort of one shot at this whether people have multiple careers these days and you just want to make the most of it um I mean, we, were, we were talking the other day weren't we about um the whole 5am club thing that you said there's a book what's it called Dan 5am club <laughs> and, it, and that, that's exactly the sort of thing you just get up and give it the best best run you can at it mm. oh, I like that philosophy you should yeah. try it it's, when you get used to it it's um, it's not too bad the 5am thing it's that the one time of the day you've got proper control over your day like the kids aren't up uh, your clients aren't on the case usually um, <laughs> 
and, you can, and I mean, that's the time for me to like, jump on the Peloton bike and just get some bits and pieces done in the morning. It's the time I own, only mine. That's good. I think it is a case of whatever sets you up for the day. There's so much talk about, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that. But everyone's different, aren't they? So if that's what sets you up for the day, it means you have a good day. You win the morning and you win the day. It's, right. It works, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, I can't do five o'clock. <laughs> if it was a holiday, Cheryl, you'd be fine. You'd be up at 5 a.m. You wouldn't be complaining. It'd all be okay. Yeah, because I know I can sleep on a sun lounger later in the day. <laughs> just, just treat it as a holiday every day. It's that treat of being able to get up and stay and, and have that morning all to yourself. And to be fair, I'm normally up by about six because my body, getting old, can't sleep past six o'clock. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I do love that first bit in the morning when no one else is up and I can just do what I want and chill. Yeah, well, we... We have a school run that starts at 6.30 in the morning, so um, it has to be a five start to, to, to get any time. That is an early school run. Yeah, yeah, but worthwhile. Yeah, def- well, definitely. So tell us a little bit about your journey and, and what has got you to where you are today. Golly, how far do we, back do we go, Dan? It's becoming a very long journey. As as you, want, you can tell us about your birth. You can tell us about your birthday if you want to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, did you always know this was the path you wanted to go on? Then, no, not at all. So, I, I, I remember I finished school. I did. I did my background. I, I love maths, and I'm quite sciencey. So, my I just like sort of maths and physics and geography and things like that at A levels, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. It, it still seems really unfair. People seem so young when they've got to make, really they start making these major choices when they're 16, when they go into A-levels. It just feels really, really early to be starting to commit to stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I, I did, did all right, actually. I did pretty well. And But I wasn't, I just didn't know what I wanted to do. So I thought, well, if I do law, it's sort of, it's pretty useful. No, it, 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 no it, I can, it's, it's a pretty credible degree to do and there's lots of things you can do with it. Although now I've been in law for so long, I can't imagine what else you do with law apart from either be a lawyer or a politician. And I wouldn't want to be a politician. Um, <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll do law. And it was great. It was three years. First two years, to be honest, a little bit tedious. Um, and it wasn't to really excite me. But it was the last year I started doing a lot more sort of corporate stuff, a lot more sort of the business side of things. And I was like, ah, this is right. Quite like this. Um, but then I thought, oh, I haven't really been paying very much attention to the rest of the law thing for the first two years. So I, I better stay on and do a master's to sort of pick up a bit more know-how. So I did a master's in IT and banking law, which was brilliant. Um, one of the main lecturers used to work for the IMF, and it was just really, really interesting. And it was like, actually, you know what? I think there is something. This has got legs. Um, and then the whole law school journey, paralegal for a while, um, eventually sort of got a training contract um, in London. And I must say, I love my training contract interview. I remember preparing for months and months. Like, this is terrifying. And anyone who's gone through the, the law route knows the training contract is so ridiculously hard to get. Um, as I, I, was like, I was pretty scared. I was pretty nervous. Uh, there was a firm I was paralegaling at. I really wanted to get the training contract. And I remember sort of stepping into the room, thoroughly prepared, ready for anything, and I was just asked, would you like a training contract here? Yes, please. And that was it. That was it. That was the, that was the extent of my training contract interview, which is wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Um, and um, so, yeah, trained, qualified, practiced quite a while in London. Kids are born in London as well. Um, my wife's a, a, a Londoner, sort of Clapham and Brixton and things like that. So, um, but eventually was very keen to, I'm a country boy. So I was keen to, to escape London and had the kids grow up with a, with a bit more space, a bit more green around them. Um, thus, we ended up close to Cambridge. Um, and um, once you're out here, you suddenly realise there's, there's a really interesting urban area that isn't London that's <laughs> just up the road. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad I've, I've landed practising in Cambridge. Um, to be frank, I don't earn as much as I used to in London. Um, but I still, I see my, my wife and my children now. Um, I really like them. And 
I, I <laughs> like to spend time with them. And it, it got to the point in London where I was, you know, I, I'd sort of say, you know, I'd, I'd see them on a Sunday night and I wouldn't see them again until the Saturday morning and they'd have a life in between, which is a bit naff. It's a bit rubbish. It's not all bad. There was lots of good things. Yeah. And, and to be honest, the, the income set us up to do some exciting stuff with houses and things like that, um, which we might touch on later, Dan. Dan and I have talked about houses quite a bit. Um, and, um, yeah, and I've sort of ended up in Cambridge via a bit of time in industry as well. I, did a, I had a sort of more techie role for a few years as well. Oh, that's really interesting. And it's so lovely to hear as well about your lifestyle and making it fit around the children and your wife. And I love when hearing people talk about their families like that. It's, yeah. I love it. <laughs> I, I think we've got to acknowledge as well that some of us are really lucky that we can do that. Yeah, um, oh, yeah definitely. The fact, no, the fact is that law out of London still paid well enough to be able to make that decision. Whilst I appreciate that not everyone has that chance. And I'm, I'm really, really grateful for that. Yeah, of course. I think it's a lot of, it's something that a lot of people strive to is having that work-life balance. And we hear about it so much as well, but it's like, there is no right or wrong work-life balance, is there? It's what works for you at the end of the day. And it's great. It sounds like you've got that balance for you, spot on. Yeah, and you've, you've got to flex it. I mean, I, I, I don't think, I think especially as you you become more, you know, take on more senior roles, you you, know, you, you still have to deliver for clients. I, I think you, you get better at managing clients' expectations as well, um, but you do you have to deliver for them. So there are times when I don't quite see as much of the kids or I don't get to bed at a sensible time and it's, it's some horrible number on the clock, but it's, it's, it's fewer and far between now. Um, and if you do get a, a squeezy while, you can always see light at the end of it, yeah. um, rather than it just sort of bashing into the next horrible thing. Um, yeah, if I, I, remember, I was going to say, my first day as a qualified Cheryl was 36 hours long. Wow. Wow, that is long. Don't recommend it. It's a dying a bit. <laughs> yeah. you get as well where well, you have got those longer days now you can then take some of that time back and be more flexible and make it work around you yeah <laughs> I don't know if you ever quite get the time back um, but I, I think I think as you I, I guess as you become a bit more established and everything sort of settles down you, you, you start valuing time as much as you do money um, I remember there's a, there's a partner I used to work with in London, um, Avram, who's brilliant. And one of the things he said to me, always stuck with me, was you can, you can always make more money, but you can never make more time. Yeah. And I was like, so right. And that's, that's genuine. It's really struck, you know, stuck with me. Yeah, no, I've, I've been hearing that a lot lately. And although you always know that, having that reminder just makes you focus on it a lot more, doesn't it? It makes you a lot more careful with your time I'd say yeah. It's, you, yeah. yeah you value your time more don't you I know I certainly do now yeah absolutely well look I've got a child at secondary school what how did that happen no <laughs> no he, he arrived moments ago it seems so um you know and it is it's just going in a flash and so I think it is really important to try and try and carve out that time with the family mm. yeah definitely you, you recently recently you've you've uh You've taken on a uh, become partner, haven't you, within the in the firm? Yeah. Has that put more pressure on you? Changed things at all? I think I'm the one who's put more pressure on me. Okay. I, I, I I'm not feeling it from anyone else. It's just for me, and I'm getting told off by by my wife quite a lot for this as well, um, because. Uh, I, I, get, I guess I, I need to get out of my head that it's all for me to do. No, yeah. it, it's, it's not. That's why you've got a team. No, that, that, that's the whole purpose of the team. And um, you've got to trust your team, which is really easy to say, but it, it takes lots of practice to get there. That's oh, God, it does. That's about me. It's not about the team. That's absolutely about me. Yeah, um, no, I, I've been having this conversation a lot lately. And, yeah, it is. I'm about to go on holiday and this will be the first time that I don't take my laptop, I'm not taking my iPad, 
I'm literally just going me. I don't have emails and stuff on my phone anyway on purpose. Just me and my book on my Kindle. And the team are actually really excited about it. And I think that's because of the work that I've been doing. It helps you to trust your team more and seeing them take over more stuff. It's yeah, it's been pretty amazing, but we do put a lot of pressure on ourselves though. Well, you know, <laughs> oh. Think about the conversations I often have with, because I, I do a lot of mergers and acquisitions work um, and think about some of the conversations I have with clients. It, it's great that you've got a business now, Cheryl, that is at that point, you can step away for two weeks and have, have, a, have a holiday, but you actually need to get it to a point where you could step away unannounced no, unexpectedly for a period of time, and it's still going to run brilliantly. Yeah. And then, then from an M&A point of view, I don't know what your plans are for the business. It's none of my business. But from an M&A point of view, you've, until you've got to that point, you're still in a business that is just a, a, a money for time arrangement, and you are the thing. So it's not really saleable. Yeah. Um, but once you can step away and it carries on looking after itself, then it's actually a business that that potentially could be could be could be sold in the future, or you could do something different with it. Yeah, exactly. We talk a lot about our clients actually, and this is one of my things. I am building the business and working towards that point because I don't know what my end goal is. I don't know if I want to sell, I want to hand over to somebody else. I don't know yet, but. If I get the business to a point where I could potentially do that, then I've got options. And this is what we say to clients as well. It's it's just giving more options. But also, the more you can do that, the more you get the lifestyle that you're working towards. So, so right, so right. What I, what I I'd oft, often say to clients who think they're going in that direction towards a sale is really spend some time thinking about who might buy your business. And that might be another business you already interact with in some way, um, or you'd like to interact with, or it might just be an avatar of what your ideal or likely buyer would be. And it's like, just, just always keep them in your head then. So every time you've got a choice, you're going to go left, you're going to go right in the business, you think, well, wait a sec, what's going to potentially fit better for that avatar I've created as that buyer? What's actually going to make this even more appealing? for them it shouldn't always drive it but i think it's a really useful sort of tool to sort of to bear in mind when you're when you're a bit torn as to which which route to take at any point yeah no that's really i like that i might have to um i might have to have a bit of blog post on that one <laughs> <laughs> you gotta ask for copyright first <laughs> <laughs> no i think that is really handy and that is yeah that is such a good idea for people to to do and think about because it will help with the, those decisions and all those important things you need to do along the way, wouldn't it? Yeah. The other thing I'm, I'm I'm constantly saying to people at the moment, it feels like, is have more than one director on companies. Sorry, I don't want to go too legally because it's <laughs> not necessarily what we're here to do. No, it's helpful though. It's, it's driving me. We've, we've had a bit of a run of um, businesses being sort of left in a tricky spot where you've got sole directors who have died. Yeah. Um, and it's it's really complicated and it puts a lot of extra pressure on the family suddenly. Um, mm-hmm. So it's like always have a second director so you can, you've got a bit of a plan if if something were to go wrong. Yeah. This is right, this is right down your street, Dan, isn't it? It's about <laughs> planning for the worse. Yeah, it is. Um, well, yeah. I'm not sure I like to quite put it that way to people, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, it's probably not going to sell much, is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's, but it's, it's completely up my street. And yeah, they are the conversations that I have a lot. Um, and it's one big area that not just like having two directors, is even if you have two directors, it's just the death of one of them is an area that is just never, ever... It's almost ignored by them. Yeah. Well, we think we're invincible, don't we? Do you Doesn't mean happen to us? You mean I'm not? <laughs> um, yeah. no. not Captain America, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh. <laughs> did not having him tattooed on me, did that not change that? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I think. It is, yeah, it's a it is a massive area that just doesn't go talked about 
um, enough. But the problem is, is twofold, is unless you're good at what you do, um, which, you know, not blowing, uh, inflating our egos or anything, but all three of us are pretty good at what we do because we've managed to be quite successful in what we do. Um, it's very difficult to get this across to people because it's quite complicated. Yeah. So it's it's being able to um, express that at a, at a level that that, that that people can take on board, isn't it? And it becomes relatable. It's complicated and people just don't like talking about it. We don't like talking about what we have. And I remember the number of times we, tr- the point where we always fall apart when we talk about our sort of future planning is who would be responsible for our children? Who would we give that? And it's like, no one's good enough. And we always get stuck. I mean, we've never got to the point where we've been able to sort of say who it would be because it, no, no one can do it like we can. No. Yeah. No, and that actually comes back really, really nicely to what you said about not being able to delegate and not being able to get at work because you feel like no one can do it quite like how you can. Yeah, uh, so, yeah. So what have you been on this process you're going through since you've been made a partner? How are you slowly starting to learn that? What have you learned a- along the way that's helped you give more to others, more responsibility to others? It, it, it's more that's just come with the fact that I've had to go, I can't do it all. Yeah. And no, I, w- I would have, I would lose that balance entirely if I tried to do it all. And I've got to, there's a reason why we recruited someone. If we trusted them enough to recruit them in the first place, we've got to trust them enough to do the job right. Mm. And if we don't trust that, we should have recruited them. It's, it's, that, it, 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 it's sort of that simple. Um, as I said, it's not about them. It's entirely about me. Um, and I, and actually probably the, the, the biggest driver for me to, to sort that out is my wife because you know, she, you know, she works in mental health space. She's a psychologist and, um, you know, she, she's, you know, she can see sometimes she sees it before me. Sometimes I think that I'm, when I'm pushing it a bit too hard. Um, and she'll, she'll call me out on it. She won't pull any punches, which no, I, I probably have a grump about at the time, but I hate to say it, but she's probably right most of the time as well. Oh, listen to your wife, we're always right. It's <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> you've been, yeah, you've been, you've been talking to my wife, Cheryl, by the sounds of it. always <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's so handy to have though and have that person that can sort you out. I know my my husband spots as well when I'm in that state of it's just becoming overwhelming because I'm doing too much because I'm not delegating and it, he, he he says it to me as well. Um probably not quite as well as your wife. But yeah, it gives yeah. me that kick up the bum when I need it. It's quite amazing as well, isn't it? How others can almost see it before you realise it as well. Yeah, I think. Yeah, um, Mark- I think I think a lot of it comes down to having a, a relationship of equals with a with another half, isn't it? And yeah, they 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 are usually right, and you know more often than not, I'm probably right about stuff she's not saying about herself. Yeah. Um, and we've just got we've just got to listen. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, that's really good. So just um, just what because we are on that, we've got. We've, we've talked about a lot of things and covered uh, quite a few things that are positive and also quite uh, like a few things that we've learned from. So what would you say is your biggest failure and then and what have you learned from that experience? And don't say like the dad's race at sports day or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> that feels like such an interview question, Dan. Doesn't Sorry. It? It's what we're here for. We're here to talk about you. <laughs> I think my, rather than failure, I think my biggest weakness is I get, I can get bogged down in detail. Um, and you, you lose sight of the thing that no, you're trying to achieve. Um, I, I think 
I made a reference earlier to, to houses, and I think that was a really good example. So I, I, I finished building a house about a year and a half ago. I'm sitting at it at the moment. It was, it was great. I'm delighted with this. Um, I ended up doing a lot of it myself because it was the middle of COVID and lockdown and things like that. Um, but I, I do remember when, when I was in the middle of the build, obsessing about the tiniest details sometimes, about the piddliest thing, about this is there or that sort and now it's all done, a step back, I just do not notice it. No one else has noticed it. And no, it doesn't bother me from day to day. And it's invisible. But at the time, it just became the most important thing. And I'd lie there in bed and I'd obsess about it. And it's like, it doesn't matter. It's just like, take a step back and, and you know, take a big picture. What's everyone else going to see when they look around this house? You know, is, the house, is it going to affect whether the house stands or not? No, it's going to be fine. Mm. Um, and it's, it's all all right. It's all okay. And I, I, I think I could take that exactly into my work as well, which is like sometimes, and this is absolutely the role of, you know, being a partner, isn't to obsess about some of those details. Because that should be, you know, for the rest of the team to obsess about. It's actually for me to sometimes say, hey, you know what? That's not going to matter in the grand scheme of things. This is the stuff that, no, this is big, this is important, let's put all our energy and effort into this rather than just the, the noise that's going on elsewhere. Oh, I, I turned it from my failure into my positive, Dan. <laughs> well, well unless you question. answered the question, you know, you're not like you said about the start with law, you could either be a lawyer or a politician. So at least you answered the question, you know, a politician would have answered the question. So... <laughs> <laughs> and it's good how you've turned it around as well because that's what we need to do and sometimes we can't do that ourselves can we we need other people to help us turn things around into yeah. a positive there's a psychology phrase that's about reframing yeah I think in coaching as well yeah there is yeah it's, it's so healthy isn't it it's just to to step away and look at it from a slightly different angle and yeah. yeah, maybe you could put a positive spin on it. Yeah, that's something I've worked on with my coach, and now it's quite, I'm quite good. I, I get brownie points because I'll go on to my sessions and I'll say the bad thing and then I'll reframe it. And before she's even had a chance to say anything, and she's just like, You, you don't need me. And I'm like, I do need you. <laughs> but it's so nice now to be able to do that reframing, which I couldn't do before. And I'd get so caught up in that moment. And it is just reframing it, positive spin. How how is this a gift, or how how can this help? And turn it around. Mm. Shout out to our sponsor, Zero, who are, in my opinion, the best accounting software out there for small businesses. One of the features I love is their invoicing. It makes it so easy for you to get your invoice out to your customers and therefore get paid. Especially, I love the repeating invoice function where if you are on a retainer model, you can just set up a repeating invoice and it just goes out every month for you without having to do anything. Check out Zero today at zero.com. Oh, if I mean, obviously, you've got a lot of this that side to you, you've got the, the work side to you and everything. What would you say is the one thing you'd want to be remembered for? Is it that sort of thing and changing perception, or is it something else? No, I think I think I'm really boring in that respect. I think it is. I just want happy, healthy kids, mm. and it's. I think it's realigning what success means as well, um, and it's it, it's not just about making as much money as you possibly can. See, it coming out of London and you no, know, and sort of cool, calling that. That earning potential down is like there's so much more to do there's so much more interesting stuff to do than sit there earning money all day in my opinion i know some people find that really exciting that's that's, that's great um uh, but yeah there's, there's there's more to life than that oh there definitely is and there's a whole world out there to explore isn't there it's um which leads me nicely to my next question actually if you could live anywhere in the world where would it be right here really no i I think about this all the time because it's so much nicer when the sun's out. Everything just feels better. Yeah, it does. But then you think, well, would it feel that much better if the sun was always out? Um, and you probably just get used to it. So I think you've got to have those, 
11 months of shocking weather, whatever it is we get, <laughs> to, to, to actually really, really enjoy it. And actually, I found one of the best things to do is something, I just hit 40, and there's something about, I've hit 40 and I've suddenly got into gardening. I don't know what it is. I've never had any interest before. But gardening is the best thing because whatever the weather's doing, you're like, hey, that's great. You know, they hope things grow or, oh, they need watering anyway or whatever it is. You can always put a positive sun on it. It's that reframing bit, perhaps, Sean. Yeah, the reframing, yeah. Um, and it's, it's, been, it's, been, it's been great. And we, I, I think, especially the last couple of years with COVID and things, people have had to look a little bit more local. Yeah. I think it's helped people remind us, we live in an amazing place. I mean, as I mentioned, going to Snowdonia in a few weeks' time, you know, over in the Norfolk Broads a few weeks ago, whatever it was. And it, there's so much good stuff here. Um, and maybe, again, with the whole electric car, trying to be a bit lighter, maybe we should be doing a bit more locally rather than jumping on planes all the time. Oh, I won't tell you. Well, I won't tell you where I'm going then. <laughs> are, you, are you net zeroing off your vegan? I, I, I'm, 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 I am a... I'm going by a catapult to Dubai. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, that's, I, it's, it is a really good way to think about it, actually. I've always been like, I just want to get to the sun because I love the sun. But yeah, I've never thought about would I not appreciate the sun as much if it, we had it. Well, in Cyprus, it wouldn't be every single day I have been there when it's not sunny and it is rainy <laughs> and I still loved it <laughs> it's warm rain yeah <laughs> yeah it was warm rain actually yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't mind doing it when it's warm <laughs> no. but, I, but I, I think I think there's a big bit about I, I feel like I'll get all silly about soppy about it almost but I'm really really lucky with sort of the loss I've been given in life. And I know there's a little bit of me that would always want to be striving to do a bit more, do a bit more, do a bit more. But there's also a danger that just never find satisfaction and comfort that way if you're always wanting a bit more than you've already got. And maybe, yeah, maybe it's a bit about actually just being thoroughly grateful for what you've got and making the most of it rather than trying to acquire more stuff. And I think that, again, that comes in maybe with the, with the, with the, with the vegan electric solar nature. It's, yeah, it is trying to ease off how much we're pulling out of the earth and using because I mean, you can't keep growing like that. That's just not going to keep working. No, it's not. Sorry, I, this isn't what no, you're no, expecting from a lawyer, is it? Sorry. No, you're fine. Really there was actually something quite, quite interesting. Um, well, it was interesting, but there was something I found really, really interesting for what you said there as well. You said about luck. So do you, do you, do you genuinely believe that luck has had quite a lot to do with um, your journey and where you've got to and your situation? Or Because there's a lot of people out there that would say that luck suggests that you are not in charge of your own destiny and therefore doesn't exist. So you know what what's your so i was having a similar conversation with my son the other day mm -hmm. and you might be blessed with the best natural sporting ability of anyone on this planet but that in itself doesn't mean you're going to become the best person in that sport you've got to still work at it mm -hmm. and you've, you've got to train you've got to practice you've got to fail and you've got to, you've got to do it again um and I think it's the same thing. I, I mean, the fact that we were born in this country, um, the fact for me that I was lucky enough that when I was much, much younger, I was struggling at the primary school I was in. I, was, no, I didn't feel very challenged. I wasn't getting very much out of it. And I was lucky enough to have grandparents who were able to pay to put me in a different school for a few years just sort of just tweak the trajectory i mean i'm that's the sort of thing where i'm aware that that's that's good fortune that that wasn't of my making that was me being lucky enough to have a, a family members who had the means and the the desire to do that and i'm so grateful um but it also that really upsets me that how many kids there must be out there 
who don't get that chance. Mm. And that's so frustrating. That just doesn't, doesn't quite seem fair. I don't know what we could do about it, but it just doesn't quite seem right that there's so much potential both for them themselves, but also for us as a, as a community is lost because you know, we, can't, we can't sort of make the most of that, that natural skill, that natural resource that might be there. Mm. Very true. Mm. Sorry, I'm going a bit heavy now. No, you're fine. You're I, I, I love fine. hearing people's views of it. And I think that's what makes, makes these co conversations so interesting because everyone's got different views and it'd be boring if we all had the same view, wouldn't it? and just understanding how people look at things. And it's challenging us to look at the way we look at things as well, because we've got our own views and speaking to other people and hearing their views. And hopefully it will challenge the people that are listening to this to challenge their views and opinions and think actually there is another side to it. So I love listening to these sort of conversations. Yeah, or they'll just go for a slightly weird, opinionated vegan lawyer who will we'll go somewhere else, thanks. <laughs> that's the beauty of it it is hearing people from walks of life that you would stereotypically think they're this way but yeah. you're not and I think that's so key to get that out there as well that just because you think you've got this view of a lawyer an accountant a financial planner you've got these views but there are people that don't fit those views we are different and we are successful be not because we're different but we are we can be different and successful. You don't have to follow that stereotype to be successful. And I think that's a really important thing to remember that you don't have to fit the mold. Come be you, be different. A lot of it is exactly that, isn't it? It's, it's owning who you are and accepting who you are and 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 you not using that to your advantage, but just never never hiding that, just always being who you are. And I think as Cheryl said, like conversations um, with, with you know lawyers, financial planners, accountants, whatever. I think this is what makes these conversations that we have so much more different. Is because you can listen to other podcasts. I think you know a lot of people listen to high performance diary CEO, all that sort of thing. There's not many of us that are going to be the CEO of Nike or. <laughs> um, run a 200 million pound business empire and sell it out so uh, it just makes it a lot more real and a lot more relatable just to see people for who they are and um yeah i can sell i can sell the business <laughs> we'll get your opportunity to say that <laughs> <laughs> no. i'm gonna change some conversation slightly Go on. i'm really actually interested to hear your view and you, what your opinion on this so my husband and I, we play the lottery game when we're in the car and we're bored. What would you do if you won the lottery? And I think this is something that's really helped me to shape my goals in life and what I want to do and the sort of things that if I had the means to, I'd be able to do. And when the podcast will go live, you're very welcome to listen to what I would do. And um, yeah, so if you won big on the lottery, what would you do with it? What would you spend it on? I'd finish the driveway. <laughs> Honestly, so we, so we, I, I, we built this house. I spent far too much building this house, but I don't, don't regret doing it. It was some all money on black in a way when we did it. Um, but then I forgot to have a budget and a thing to, to do the driveway. And it turns out it's really expensive to do, yeah. a, to do a driveway well. Yeah. Um, and I, sort of, I haven't got the money to finish it. Um, and there's always been other calls that are more important. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's still all I can see is weeds. It, it's it, it's it's it, it's definitely a rewilding project at the front. When I look at that. Um, so yeah, I do that. Hopefully, I'd have some change left. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about really big millions on the lottery. I hope you'd have some change left <laughs> as you <in> your drive. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, Unless you're having your drive made out of gold. Or... Oh, that'd be a bit garish, wouldn't it? <laughs> Imagine cleaning it as well. Oh. Yeah, but you'd have um, somebody to clean it for you, surely, if you won the lottery that big. <laughs> I didn't like that. The idea of having people to do it for you. It's a bit, yeah. 
never quite got around to having a cleaner. I've got a Roomba, the robot vacuum cleaner, but I haven't, I've never had a cleaner. Um, but and the rest of the rest of it, I pay off the mortgage, and I, I'm just not really wanting for anything else. I mean, I, I keep on saying I, I think I put another building project in me. I, it, was, it was horrible. It was the hardest year of my life, but I'd love to do it again. Um, but I wouldn't want to move from where I am, both the house and the location and stuff. Maybe that's back to that point about being grateful. I'm, mm. I'm really pleased with what we've got, and we've got more than enough. So, yeah, I'd pay off the mortgage. I'd probably put enough aside to cover the kids' school fees. And then I'd, I'd, I love the idea of being able to, if it was enough money, to stop work and my job become how to use that money in, a, in an exciting way for, to, help, to help people, to do funky stuff. Probably with a bit, a bit of an environmental slant, um, knowing me. But um, I'd obviously have to get permission from Mrs. Wilkinson as well. <laughs> do, do a mini Bill and Melinda Gates sort of thing, but yeah. stay, but stay together, stay married. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that sounds really interesting. I think it gets you thinking. It definitely has. Mine, mine's evolved. We play this a lot, especially when we're on long car journeys. So we've had the chance to really think about this and plan and plot and. There's some stuff that I would absolutely love to do um, to help people. And I remember a session with my coach and she's like, well, some of that stuff you want to do, why can't you do it anyway? And then I was like, yeah, why can't I? So we have started putting some wheels in motion and there are some things that I can actually do now. So yeah. I think it's, yeah, it does get you thinking of what you can and can't do doesn't it anything you want to share Cheryl not quite yet yeah <laughs> <laughs> won't be too long hopefully but no I just want to help people that have been in similar um situations to what I've had in the past with domestic violence and and overcoming how you feel after it and mm -hmm. over and basically getting your life back and striving for more than you think you can never do. Oh. So, yeah, yeah. But we'll be revealed. Basically, yeah. Yeah, no, I talk, have plans. <laughs> you talk about it quite a lot, don't you? In your in your in your in in your podcast, you talk about it quite a lot. Um, how actually that would work, how that would work, and how you'd like to execute it, don't you? So. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Another story for another day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're going to ask me questions. I'm not supposed to throw questions on the air. Yeah. So, so again, it's probably something a little bit different, but what is your biggest pet peeve? People who walk through London with obnoxiously large umbrellas with a spike at groin height when they're holding it parallel to the ground. There's nothing worse. I know it is. I love these questions because <laughs> you're just like, yes, I, I, yeah, I totally agree with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've we've had some different ones when we asked that, but that is certainly one we haven't heard before. <laughs> the way you answer that, that you can tell that really does wind you up. <laughs> You know what I was saying earlier about not sweating about the small stuff? I think I've just completely <laughs> put myself in the foot in that one. <laughs> You've always got something that you just, yeah. Yeah. I'll edit that statement out and then you'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> and leading on to that, and I know we've touched on it a bit with the stereotypes as well. So what, you're a lawyer, obviously, what about your industry frustrates you? I think some people take too long to respond to their clients or fellow professionals. Um, I think answering things pretty quickly is really helpful because it, even if you can't do stuff, it's just all about communication. Um, and there's nothing worse than radio silence. And I've been lucky enough to get a number of clients 
because they've just got fed up with their lawyers not getting back to them fast enough. Um, and look, we're professional services. We can't do that. No, snap. I was about to say, yeah, we get that a lot as well. It is frustrating, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be instant in actually getting something substantive, but people need to know that they've been heard. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we, oh, you're probably the similar things. We hear that people don't hear back from their accounts for like weeks on end. And I'm just like, how? Yes, all right, maybe not immediately the same day, but next day, or even just something to say, I've got your message and I'll come back to you. But yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. We, situation we share. <laughs> We, we sometimes have to remind accountants um, that if we're working on a transaction, the turnaround times are different to those to, to the normal day to day compliance thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I need to be on the end of a hotline yeah. to them. Um, so, yeah, this is a bit of a bit of a learning process, um, early doors and transaction on that front. Mm. It, well, communication is extremely important, isn't it, in pretty much everything that we do? So yeah. important to make sure. Yeah. Um, it's something my, my, my wife being a psychologist very good, she forces me to talk to her. In a really healthy way. It's sometimes <laughs> like, no, stop, sit down, let's 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 talk about this. Um, which is probably the best thing I should be doing, you know, I could be doing. Um, but it's the last thing I want to do. Yeah. No, I love it. That's really cool. <laughs> If somebody was starting out on their journey now and wanted to become a lawyer, what sort of advice or what would you say to them? I think, I think if someone was still very sort of early in the journey and was sort of leaving school and you know, think about university and things like that, I think I'd probably encourage them to do a degree in something that they are a subject they're really interested in. Not do it in law, but just do it in, like for me, it, it should have been science. Um, and then go down the law law route. Because I think you just take a, a different sort of strength and you know, you have a, be, a slightly different sort of know-how mm -hmm. um, base. Um, and I, I think it makes you maybe a little bit more three-dimensional um, I think that's quite the right phrase, but you know what I mean? It's, it's I know, more, yeah, I like that. Dynamic. I, I, that's what I definitely encourage. Yeah. Uh, oh, I cool. think it's also quite good for a lawyer to, at some point, spend some time working in industry. Um, yeah. It wasn't part of my plan, but I ended up doing it. But coming back into practice, having spent some time actually working in a massive global business and understanding the the peculiarities of working in a business like that, or the politics, or the decision making, the different types of teams that work in it, I think only helps then when yeah. you're when you're practicing and you're advising that you you've got a bit more of a feel as to what it is like on the ground. I wouldn't say I'd get it right every time. Every, every business is different, but it, I think it gives you a little bit more ability to empathise with the with what they're facing day to day. Yeah, and no, I, def I definitely agree with that. Actually, it's from the accountant point of view as well having that time in industry being in a, a business and seeing how a business operates and works means you can only improve your own perception of it and therefore help your clients more when you come back into practice because you actually know and have been there I think there's nothing more frustrating than someone trying to help you when they've had no first-hand knowledge or experience of it it's yeah. it's yeah you need that different angles and different viewpoints it also helps you run your own business oh god yeah <laughs> <laughs> no whether you're an accountant or a lawyer we're, we're not trained how to run our own businesses but then we're supposed to be advising other people how to do that it, it's a bit weird yeah. um but I, yeah I, I think it's it's only good i'm so i'm so glad i did do it yeah no i i did that too and i think it is it's really opened my eyes up to a lot and i've worked in a couple of different businesses both in different roles as well so having that experience helps you to see things from different points of view as well and mm. yeah running your business is hard we don't as you say none of us learn how to run a business do we we learn our craft not yeah. <laughs> how to run a business it's yeah. 
there's always something as well, isn't there? It's almost like just as you think you might just have cracked it, you walk around that corner and something hits you like a, like a steam train, doesn't it? It's like a um, yeah that you just didn't expect to happen or thought was coming. Keeps it exciting, Dan. Mm, doesn't it always? Definitely keeps you on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> so on the, like going into industry and you say about going into industry and learn it learning your craft um so if someone was to do that what is the most common myth that you think there is in your in your field i think people sometimes hear the word lawyer solicitor and they think oh they're rolling in it um, <laughs> and I'm still waiting to pay to do my driveway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for that lottery. Room. But uh, but uh, it, it's it's so there's so many different strands to it. You no, know, I, I do corporate, but you now I know people who do sort of criminal work and family protection work and things like that. It's the same same badge, same job title, but worlds apart. Absolutely worlds apart. Um, and uh, the other thing which people always seem to think is because I'm a lawyer, I somehow need know how to deal with their neighbour dispute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great, I know nothing about party walls and fences and things like that. <laughs> Uh, Are you sure after all everything you've gone through with the build and <laughs> <it's really done. laughs> was I supposed to do something about party wall notices? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it's almost around the. That's an interesting one, though. So people <laughs> asking you about other things. Do you find that people try and pick your brains, um, a lot for, like almost pick your expertise and uh, expect everything in return for for nothing back, if that makes sense. Um, occasionally, occasionally, I think people take the mic, but on on the whole, I. I think I'm pretty, actually, I'm quite proud that I'm quite generous with my time. Um, I'm lucky enough to have experienced quite a lot of stuff and can share that knowledge. And that's, that's, oh, golly, that's my bread finished. <laughs> go and go and get your bread. <laughs> but I'll, um, <laughs> it's only a small loaf. Um, but no, actually, just sharing those sort of more general insights, that's, easy for me to give and is only helpful and you know what sometimes it might turn into an instruction for me sometimes it might not but even if it doesn't actually if you've looked after people and you've genuinely watched out for them don't tell their mate down the pub or one of their business contacts or whatever it is I'll have a chat with you know James he was really helpful at that time um, and you know it, 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 it tends to pay off in the long run Oh, no. as long as you, as long as you, yeah, give, gen give, give the time generously. Don't expect anything in return for it. But on the whole, no, I, I don't feel like I've, you know, I don't feel like people take advantage of that. Hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. I've got to get that bread. Yeah, go, on. go and get the bread. Go on. <laughs> sorry, pause it again. No, sorry. Um, uh, it's me talking again. Cheryl, before we before we started recording, we were we were talking about um, the Wim Hof method and the the cold exposure and things. And um, I, yeah, you've I, definitely not sold that to me. So what's more likely to happen, five a.m. or a cold shower? Oh God, there's a question. Um, the five a.m. probably. I can't do cold showers. But it's just no. <laughs> Yes. Well, when we're in Cyprus and it's warm and it's sunny and I can go and sit out on our balcony or something and have a nice cup of tea with a book. Okay. All right. Okay. So you've, got to, you've got to reframe it. The cold shower is a, is a, is a pleasure. It's a gift. I can't. I'm sorry. I can't. I've had too many cold showers. I cannot reframe that into something good. <laughs> I was thinking as well with when they're associated with negativity, like your boiler breaking or whatever else, it's kind of probably yeah. quite hard to pick it back, isn't it? So it is. It, oh, yeah, no, no, I can't, can't reframe really that. 
Sorry, Sharon, I've asked you another question. That's not that's not where it's supposed to work, is it? It's fun. <laughs> it's totally fun. And I'm going to actually, because we normally say, what, how do you think your industry is going to look in five? I'm going to reframe this. How, if you could reframe the legal industry, how would you reframe it? <laughs> that's a hard one. <laughs> it's massive. It's... I would i could be careful because my colleagues might see this um, <laughs> we're talking like the the sky. So we, <laughs> I, uh, we we still charge on an hourly rate yeah and it, it's it, it's genuine it's quite hard not to because all weird stuff always comes out on yeah. a transaction you know, it's, and you, you can't legislate for everything um but i'd much rather do things on a on a fixed basis on a, on a particular fee and accountants are much better at this than, than yeah. lawyers are um because I'm, I'm a user of legal services and no i don't like the hourly fee um and it it, it just rewards inefficiency and uh, and there's there's all sorts of interesting technologies out there that can assist us. And I think actually, if, if you know, if it was much more fixed fee, I am really worried what my colleagues are going to say when they hear this. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, if it's much more fixed fee, it does make you think about how you resource transactions or pieces of work in a different way, and that's resourcing it between humans and the technology. Um, and how you then deliver the, the final product. Um, and I totally agree on that point. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel it, 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 the rewarding inefficiency thing is, is problematic. I like to think I'm very efficient and very good value for money, obviously. Um, yeah. But um, thank you, Dan. That's an, I think that was a nod. I'll take that. Yeah, I'm agreeing. <laughs> um, I'm agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's really, it's, yeah, at, at the end of the day, customers see themselves as buying a product, yeah. but lawyers are often seeing them seeing it as more of an art still. Yeah. Um, and they've got to meet somewhere in the middle. It's not quite as simple as always fixed fee, but it's got to meet somewhere. Yeah, no, and I, I totally agree with that. Um, it is easier for us to do the fixed fee and do it on a transactional volume, for example, than the hourly rate. I wouldn't have exactly the same for you. It's like if we charge bookkeeping on an hourly rate, we we may have a, be having a really bad day, not feeling well. It's going to take us three times as long. Yeah. And we're never going to find the efficiencies in that because if we make it more efficient, it's going to take less time, which means we can charge more. So I totally, totally agree with that side of it. And But it's balance. It's just so hard to do. Even now we go like, well, how are we going to charge for this? And it's like, well, we can only charge on time because I don't know how else to charge for it. Yeah. So. Yeah. The other thing I'd like to see lawyers do more is that uh, you probably got by now. I I want to see us as a as a society do a lot more environmentally. Um, and I'm lucky enough that a lot of my clients, a lot of my work is in the sustainable space, and that's quite deliberate. Um, but actually, I, th I think there's lawyers can actually lead the way in in that. So there's ways we can draft, particularly sort of commercial contracts. That can have an influence, um, and I wrote an article a while ago. It was quite short. It was called "Lawyers Can Save the World." It sounds quite big-headed, but actually, it's the there's so much I can do as as, as a single individual. You know, put my solar panels on and don't have hot showers and all that sort of stuff. But it, it it's still fairly minor in the grand scheme of things. But if I, through my drafting and through my conversations with clients and the way we structure certain things, if we can create incentives further down supply chains and with sort of other partners in businesses, that that could be that can make a big difference. That's a, that can make a much bigger difference than I can as a as a regular human being at home. Um, it sort of makes me think. I um, there's a, a charter airline I I know, and I was talking to their um, their sustainability lead, and I just thought it was so exciting because. They've got the ability to pull a few levers here and there 
and knock out tons of CO2 like that, you no, know, beyond what you could ever imagine doing at home. And I've, I've sort of potentially got that ability. I do a bit of it already, but I, I know there's more I could do on that front. Yeah. Um, and I, I think we all need to feel a bit more empowered on that side of things. Yeah. Well, definitely, I definitely agree. There's a, we're seeing in our industry, we've seen a lot more of it as well. It started off with, um, like through B1G1, I know a lot of um, our suppliers and partners, um, and we do it as well. We do a lot of giving through B1G1 and things like planting trees and stuff like that, but we're seeing a lot more of it now. I think there was actually the last account we went to, there was a massive stand all about sustainability and it was how we as accountants can help with the sustainability, becoming more aware of what we're doing as well. And I thought it was really interesting actually. Yeah, but we, we also, I think we've got to be careful in, in what we do, that so you mentioned planting trees and it's great, but we can't keep thinking that planting trees is the solution to everything else. We can't yeah. use that as our excuse to, to carry on as usual. Oh, it, no, it's it's got to be a behavioural change and it's got to be reducing the, the demand for this stuff in the first place rather than just trying to offset it. Exactly, and I think that's, I mean, we've been digital for years and we never did it specifically for sustainability and to save on paper and things. But going that digital route has had those other consequences. So therefore, we are helping. And it's things like that that you do without even really actually thinking of the other consequences. But it's like, well, can you not take that and take it another step further and to be more sustainable? And there's a lot we can do without having to do too many big shifts isn't there but we just don't see it <laughs> you've got to start by measuring Cheryl yeah everyone, everyone keeps on going it's a bit like going to the gym going I'm going to get fitter it's like well where are you now where do you want to get to yeah. and uh, where are your milestones in between and I, I think a lot of people keep on forgetting to do the measuring bit before they start the sustainability journey um, yeah. it's the same with every journey true. isn't it yeah every you're right journey, you, need right. A, you need your starting point and you need your goals and then you need to measure along the way to know how you're doing is right. a is a massive thing at the moment, isn't it? I think in a lot of industries, um, because it seems to be the one thing though that concerns me with it is especially in my industry, is we got you get a lot of providers and a lot of people talk about it, but it's just that. Yeah. They say right, we're doing this within this product or this within this fund range. And um, it's you look at it and it's it's words. It's not anything. Yeah, I think I think you see that in, on two fronts. You see it definitely with the whole sort of green washing, as they yeah. call it. But I think this year more than ever, I I, I must say I, I I felt there was quite a lot of pride washing going on. Um, a lot of people seem to think, well, if you change your logo for a month and put it into rainbow colours, that means we're, we're doing something. It's like, well, no, you're not. No. It's like, what are you doing beyond that? Um, you know, that that's, that's not going to change the world. That just gets you a bit of soft, fuzzy points for, for a month. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. You have to actually walk the walk, not just talk it. Yeah, it's right. more about what would your um, LBGTPQ plus um, employees say about you? they're working for them and what you're doing for them to support them and that sort of thing isn't it yeah i think there's lots of bandwagons that can be jumped on but oh god yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's about the action isn't it rather than the, the color of your logo mm. it definitely is it just gets concerning though as well isn't it it's like i mean in, in um in in our industry there there's people that have set literally set up research firms to test what people are saying because it is so greenwashing and saying they're doing something and not is just so rife that people have actually had to set up extra firms to make sure that these yeah. are sustainable or they are ethical or there are environmental social governance or whatever they're labeling themselves as. So There's definitely a lot of cynicism around ESG now, Dan. It doesn't really mean anything, does it? Because in the end of the day, what if you look at ESG in principle, it was actually it's actually just good investment practice. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> um, yeah. So there's a lot of stuff around it. Yeah, absolutely. 
it, it makes sense to invest in companies that have good governance because they're well run and <laughs> it makes good sense to invest in companies that look after their staff because they stay and they're more productive so the company make more money and it just it, it's just sensible yeah you should only really have ESG companies out there nothing else should really survive in <laughs> no exactly <laughs> exactly I'm so thank you for that I'm gonna ask you um kind of the big question that we always ask uh, at the end um of when we're talking to someone and this just brings up some interesting interesting conversations really but what's one question you'd wish we'd asked and how would you answer that I might go worky again. That's fine. Um, and it, it's probably an underlying stuff. Hey, James, if I was about to sell my business, or I was thinking about selling my business, what should I do? What should I think about? And it sounds really boring. I've heard this question so many times. And, but, and, and, and it's, it's more of a plea than anything, which is talk to your advisors really really early it's just you, know, you can't yeah. talk, you can't talk too early no one's going to get grumpy and say oh you've wasted my time no no one's going to turn the clock on well i don't i wouldn't um and it, just talk through it because actually we've been down that journey so many times and there's so many things we can do before things get moving that can make a difference to you. It could make the whole process easier and simpler. It could increase your chances of actually a sale going through once you've got to an agreed stage. And it may well still give you time to fiddle around with your arrangements and your shareholdings and things to make sure that you get the best results but financially, but also from a tax point of view that you possibly can. It just takes a few early conversations um, rather than going, oh, we've just signed these heads of terms. We want to do it within the next four weeks. It's like, no, yeah. there's only so much we can do then. And I, 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 my favourite clients, the ones who are not parachuted in just to do a deal, but I've actually, I had one a little while ago, we completed earlier this year, Well, I've been working with them for maybe three years, three and a half years, running up to that exit, getting ready for the exit. And it was so smooth and so easy as a result of that. Well, it's never easy, but easier as yeah. a result of that. Um, what would you say? I was going to say, what would you say is your like optimal time to start talking to somebody? Because I know I would think, well, I'm not going to exit for another twenty odd years. I don't know. I'm just making this figure up. But so I would just think, right, well, that's too early now. But is that too early, or is that something that you what where? What is that optimal time? I think 20 years is a long time. Um, I think, right? It's, uh, uh, no, 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 but it's, 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 it. <laughs> it's typical. But I, I think at that point, we'll probably start some questions about what might an exit be. Is that a succession? No, is it it's going to kids? Is that this is a sort of business that actually fits an MBO or an EOT or something like that much better? Sorry, management buyout or employee ownership trust much better. Um, or would it be a, a, a trade or a financial sale? If it's trade and financial sale, it probably is a bit too early. Yeah. Um, but if you think about MBOs and things like that, you can't you can't start early enough because it's about getting the right management team in place to have an MBO team there at, re, there at the relevant time. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to succession, it's about actually just having the whole structure of that entity right. So you, especially if you're giving to multiple children, to make sure that you're you're not going to create a scenario where you could put your children in conflict um, with each other, which is really easy to do if you don't. Oh think God, yeah. <laughs> I, I, unfortunately, I've um, experienced that for, with friends and things. It's, it's horrible. Well, it's, it's disaster. It's horrible. It's absolutely awful. But there's a lot that could be done beforehand to to get that right, and that comes with that you know, that planning. Who knows what's around the corner? Actually. That's the sort of thing you should be looking at at the same time as you're thinking about a will. Is actually, well, great, I'm giving this stuff in my will, but is this stuff in a state that's ready to be given? Is it in the right structure 
that could be that it could be given. Um, but when uh, so beyond the the, the the super long sort of horizon, I, I, I think it's a really healthy thing if people start looking at it sort of a couple of years before. Um, I mentioned two years because that's the point where entrepreneurs relief kicks in, where you've got to have been holding shares in their in a particular way for, for at least that period of time. So uh, that there's there's things we could genuinely do that can make a massive difference. You know, if you're selling a business for a million pounds, you're making you're making a gain of a million pounds, get it right and you save yourself a hundred grand straight off. No, that and that, that's that's real money in my book. And it's worth thinking, you know, spending, okay. spending a couple of hours thinking about it two years before, just in case. Um, so, I, and the, the, other, the other advantage of starting a couple of years early is that if we can start kicking the tires then, doing that sort of internal sort of test of the business to see how it would do when it's, when it's, when it's subject to the rigor of a buyer's sort of in investigation, there's sort of due diligence process, it allows us to find any of the problems early and fix them, or at the very least, put together a, I'm not saying a fictitious story at all, but put together a proper explanation, a story as to why that is and, and present it in the best way you possibly can, rather than the first you know about it is your buyer telling you that yes. there's something a bit peculiar and then you're on the back foot. And then before you know it, they're chipping. Yeah. Um, shipping on the price. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say in, the, in an ideal world, a, a couple of years before would be would be perfect. It doesn't always work like that because these things come by surprise, and we we know if we don't have two years, we don't have two years. Um, but that that would be my ideal. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? It makes it makes a lot of sense. Okay. So this is kind of the root of you can never be too prepared. Yeah. <laughs> Right, especially when tax is involved, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think if there was a second question you're going to ask me, I wouldn't do a work one. It would be, I know you didn't ask me a second one, but I'm going to anyway. That's nice. um, which would be um, about the house build and was it worth it and things like that. And back linking that to the environmental piece, um, I get really upset. I think building bricks are pretty rubbish. I think they're they're far too low standards. That's why self builders, you know, we don't care about building rigs because pass them easily. Um, and I think the best thing about having built a house that's properly efficient is my utility bills, including charging two cars, um, all in comes to about hundred quid a month, which is about what it's costing to fill a car up at the moment once. Mm. And for me, that's like that's really good. Amazing. And I, I don't say that in a boastful way. I say it in a, actually, it's, it's the answer possible. possible. It's what we can actually do if we, if we try and achieve that sort of efficiency in, in housing and transport and things like that. Um, and yeah, I think no, really I it's really insightful. Yeah. It is. Yeah, it is. It's insightful. I, we watch, my husband, we love watching all these building programmes and things. And Oh, I've been that person that's gone like, oh, here we go again. It's another another one of these. But you've just explained it to me now. And I just think, I just thought it was somebody was doing it because they're environmental and they want to do this and the other to help the environment and everything. I never looked at it from that point of view as well. So I think that's a really important message to get out there. I'm so cynical. I'm sorry, I am. But <laughs> hearing it from that point of view, you're changing my mind and views. I think it's really, I think it's really exciting. And I, I think we... Yeah. We don't have the best housing stock in this country when it comes to efficiency, but it's knowing actually we could do so much better and save a massive amount of money. And that, that's both homes and businesses. No, yeah. business properties aren't necessarily very good either. Um, and you know, it would lighten the load massively on, you know, on the grid and on sort of our, our call on whether it's fossil resources or renewable resources if we just you know we're slightly less wasteful yeah there's a lot of money to save isn't it and it's, a yeah. lot, it's it is it's really and it's so interesting i'm gonna love these conversations you just learn so much <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's um 
yeah, you can't really argue, can you, with that sort of level of saving? Because you're talking about what the average, as you say, the average person putting in what hundred to two hundred pound a month in each car in petrol, probably more now. Um, gas and electricity is probably what nearly two hundred pound a month for most people at the moment. With how well, it's doubled, mine's more. Yeah, so it's just. That's a, that's a, it's, 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 it could be the time. It could be the time. Yeah, and it's yeah, as, and you know, as utility bills go up more and more, it becomes more more sensible. Mm -hmm. uh, I recommend it. It's, it's quite fun to live with as well. <laughs> you got lots of gadgets that help you control it. Yeah, uh, they're all hidden away. Otherwise, they look like old gadgets, don't they? In about five years' time, you'll look like you've got a five-year-old iPad to see in the wall. It'd be a bit a bit sad. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Sorry to anyone who's got iPads in their walls. So. <laughs> I haven't. I'm all right. <laughs> no. Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, that is really insightful. Um, thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, oh, I thoroughly you. enjoyed chatting. Um, um, good to catch up with you guys. Yeah, it's been good. brilliant. Thank you. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please like and subscribe. And we'd also love to hear your feedback. So please leave us a review or drop us a DM on our Insta at Found a Life Podcast. See you in the next episode. <laughs>